Well, good morning. <laughs> hey, girl. <laughs> Yes, the delegation be everywhere. That is the delegation. We never get to do things in New York, so I'm so excited that we're doing something here, mm -hmm. having this conversation. Thank you so much for hosting this and coming mm -hmm. out. Um, babe, why don't you get us started? Yeah, first of all, I just want to give it up one more time for Charlemagne for creating this space for this, this valuable ongoing conversation. You know what I love about it? I love that they call it mental wealth. Because that, that suggests that, you know, obviously health is wealth, but that suggests that if we get our mind right, everything else comes up. And uh, I think this is really cool, particularly as people who are also in the faith community, because for a long time, um, therapy or, or really acknowledging mental health issues was kind of taboo. Was that anybody's experience? You couldn't really talk about it in faith circles, just pray it away, so to speak, and, and that was it. Uh, but times are changing. For sure. I was just thinking about the black church and mental health and the strides that I believe that we're making. And I have language for it now, but I am thinking how empowered I would have been had I known growing up that what I was experiencing was depression. I just felt like I was disconnected from God, that the faith thing wasn't working for me, that there was something wrong with me, not realizing that my experience had actually created depression within me. Mm. And I think it's so important that we continue to marry our mental health and faith because it gives our relationship with God so much more power. Mm -hmm. Like God's not meeting with this representative. He's not meeting with this person who we think we are, but we get to say like, I'm depressed. I'm experiencing mm -hmm. anxiety. And from this place, I can have a genuine encounter and really know how to pray. Because mm. what happens when you don't experience mental health and have the language that you need in order to really show up with your relationship with God is you just be praying like yeah, right right with no idea yeah just talking yeah. and what am I supposed to say but I think giving having language at my age has helped me to really have a deeper more authentic relationship with God not to cover up what I'm feeling mm -hmm. but to sit in it and process it and believe that there's wisdom and hope mm -hmm. on the other side that's so true baby I think um I feel like spirituality was never intended to replace reality Right, that was never that was never the goal of even if you you know if you're a person of faith you, you read scripture or whatever you never see the Lord like denounce somebody for being sick or if they came and they said hey you know I'm I'm sick or I'm oppressed spiritually or whatever you never you never heard him say no you're not he just healed them so I think that to your point spirituality is never a substitution for reality but spirituality is powerful enough to give you a better reality. I believe that with all of my heart. Do you think that people have left communities of faith because they weren't able to be completely transparent about how they were feeling or someone was saying pray over it and you're having real issues of depression, of anxiety, and the prayer literally isn't working? Do you think that that's the reason why we've seen so many people kind of fade away is the place where you're supposed to keep it real, it, you're pretending? I believe so. I, I think that... Uh, <laughs> she preaching already, huh? Yeah. No, I, I think so. I think that we're in a time, even like this is an information age. We can get like data and research and facts. We can get the truth, if you would, at the click of a button. And so this notion that we can, you know, hide behind, you know, um, clever colloquialisms and, you know, just pray it away or just name it and claim it, all that stuff. Some of it is scientifically proven to not be true. And so, and so when you aren't being real and you just put up this wall of religion or spirituality, first of all, you don't get healed. Um, and so you have teachers that, that should actually be students, you know, or, or teachers that should actually be patients. And I just think that, that uh, people want something real and they'll do at whatever and go wherever to get it. Can you tell me from your own personal experience? Get out of my business. At, well, my, here we are. Business. Yeah. <laughs> at what stage in your life did you realize, like, I know God, you know, I know scripture, I've been to church, but there is something else going on. And how did you give yourself permission to begin to really dig into that? Oh, man, shoot. Oh, I mean, how, how transparent can we be? So I went through a divorce in 2012. And in order for me to even muster up the, the reality that 
um, that this thing wasn't working, that this thing was going to end. I, mean, I had to question a lot of the things that were forced on me in the religious space, in the church space. And, and in doing that and in seeking truth, right? Faith, let me tell you something. One of the things about faith and science, I was at MIT last night talking, but one of the things about faith and science, one of the things that connects them is the concept and the notion of journey. If your faith is not a journey, if you've arrived in your faith, you don't have faith at all. Faith itself is a journey, and so is science. Science is a journey of discovery. And so when I, was, when I had to deal with and confront the fact that the way that faith was being taught to me as it relates to marriage and divorce wasn't true, it put me into this place of openness and curiosity, and I went to therapy, and in therapy, I discovered that, not because of faith, but I discovered that I had built my life around ideas that, quite frankly, for me, weren't true. And so once I realized that I could be wrong, and that I could not only be wrong, but build a foundation, a whole life, a marriage, on um, a false idea, then it made me open to continue on the journey of learning. And even to this day, let me put it this way. It's kind of like when you realize that there could be something operating in your blind spot that you don't know, that you can't see, you can be functioning, thinking that you are well, but not well, and then come and have an epiphany that that is not the case. Once you discover that one time, you will forever be suspicious of okay. Right? You'll be suspicious of your okay. In other words, I might say I'm okay, but I need to have processes and practices and disciplines and community and therapy and other things to make certain that my okay is actually okay. That's so good. I can remember um, seeking out a therapist. I started therapying myself first because um, I wasn't sure about people being in my business. And so I started like reading these different books and uh, listening to podcasts because sometimes taking that initial step into therapy can be very scary. And I don't know if I'm ready to unleash all these things. And so there is a sense of control that comes with reading books and materials that makes you feel like I can take this at my own pace. But I eventually got to a stage where I'm like, I want to talk this out with someone and ultimately I was dealing with the reality that I did not feel present in my own life like things were happening that I was supposed to be celebrating but like I didn't it was very con shoulder shrug I, it was very shoulder shrug like I, when I made the New York Times bestsellers list I was just kind of like that's nice you know like it didn't feel like yeah, I wasn't there. And so I started going to therapy to try and figure out what robbed me from the ability to feel. At what point did I come to a space where I felt that the only way I could show up in my life is if I wasn't fully present. And so now I don't experience joy, but I'm not angry. And I don't experience anger, but I also don't have the ability to really tap in with my children. So I started going to therapy and it's been life changing for me. I have an incredible therapist, but one of the things that I realized culturally, and I don't know if it's just black culture or in black church, but I only ever been black, so I can only speak all we got. from my neighborhood. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think we put so much emphasis on surviving that we think surviving is the trophy. Like, yeah, but I survived it. Yeah, but I survived it. Yeah, but were you restored? Was there wisdom connected to it? What can you teach someone else who went through that? And when the trophy is survival, we stop there instead of recognizing that I can have hope again. I can have joy again. I don't have to walk with this limp, this emotional limp, this emotional damage that keeps me from showing up in my life. And that's where vulnerability comes in. And for me, that's where my relationship with God comes in because it's like I survived but I don't want to go through it again. But I think mental wealth is respecting the resiliency of your wounds so that you can show up in your present with confidence that I don't know what's going to happen, but I don't have to be afraid because I didn't just survive. I recovered mm -hmm. after the survival. That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. So this expo, this expo, I love that Obviously, there are mental health themes that we're going to dig into throughout the course of the day, amazing speakers, but I love that it's not called a mental health expo. Mm -hmm. I love that it's called a mental wealth expo. And, um, and I just think that the most valuable thing that you and I possess is between our ears, 
I really believe that, that our, our mind is supposed to work for us and not against us. I'm, I'm under the belief that in every moment of the day, brilliance, there's a brilliant thought, a brilliant awareness, a brilliant reality, a brilliant strategy, a brilliant perspective that's made available to us. But oftentimes we have to work through a lot of the negative thoughts, a lot of the negative things to get to that brilliant thought. I, I believe in every single moment there is brilliance. I believe that, that this thing that, that God gave to us to function, to lead us, um, is amazing. And so when we start talking about mental wealth and how to get to this place of mental wealth where our mind is, is working for us, how many authors are in there? Authors or artists or creatives? Raise your hand. So, so you all know, you know, ultimately, and we're obviously authors and do things, but, but a lot of our wealth is connected to our head, literally. Our ability to create intellectual property, um, our ability to function well in relationships, right? You can't be a successful business person unless you know how to manage relationships at some level, even if you're, you know, it's, it's a relationship with two or three employees, you have to have that. So having a healthy head will make you wealthy. So how do we get to this place of mental wealth? Well, if we look at it the same way we look at finances, you think about financial wealth, the first thing we have to do is get educated, right? We have to understand how finances work. We have to understand how businesses work, how all those streams come together. But one of the things that I've learned is that knowledge alone isn't it. You know, we know that, you know, if we eat, you know, I don't know what you guys eat out here in New York, but we have In-N-Out Burger, we have Fat Burger, or whatever. We know that if we eat certain things, we're not going to do well. We have knowledge, but that doesn't mean that we do well. And so I believe that, that education is the first step. If we were to break it down into three phases that get you to mental wealth, right, to get us to a place where our mind is working for us, we first must be educated. I think that, that that's why this is so important. Honey, what, what do you do or what would you say are ways that people can get educated about, about mental health so that they can get to mental wealth? Yeah, I think part of education is understanding that there's no way that you have gone through the things that you have experienced and you are okay without there having been some type of process. Mm -hmm. I think it's knowing that if you experienced a divorce, if you experienced abandonment as a child, rejection as a child, that though it may be something that is familiar within your community and within your circle, it ju just because it's normalized doesn't mean it's healthy. Mm -hmm. And I think having the ability to say, okay, maybe that did hurt. Maybe that did change the way I see my potential. Maybe that did change the way I see relationships. Maybe I'm not okay. Mm -hmm. I think to know thyself is empowering. Yeah. And there is something beautiful about understanding I'm probably not okay, which means I can't always trust my reactions to certain things. Am I reacting from a place of hurt and anger or am I responding from a place of health and wellness? And so for me, when I take a minute and I look at my life and I look at my schedule, and I look at some of the new trauma and the old trauma that has shown up in my life, I have to take a minute and ask myself, like, am I really showing up with a well-rounded view of all of the versions of me that can respond to this moment? It happens between us all the time, because mm -hmm. listen, child, he be... He be. He be. <laughs> what I be? You be challenging my thoughts, you oh. know, Oh. stretching me, helping oh. me to see things from another perspective. And I'd be like, <laughs> <laughs> I don't like that. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, that's not for me. I don't enjoy that. It makes me feel inadequate. It makes mm. me feel like you don't think I'm smart. It makes me feel like you think I made a poor decision. It makes me feel like a 13-year-old girl who got pregnant. Mm. Mm. So when I end up drawing that line back to, are you paying for asking me a question about a business decision or are you paying for the residue of me feeling like I don't make good decisions because of something that happened to me? Wow. And that's the kind of work that just have you out here eating cake. Cause like, <laughs> I don't have time to be in my feelings like this, but also, 
yeah. I guess it makes for a good marriage. So like, here I am telling him that though you asked me about a contract, when you questioned the fact that I signed it, it made me feel like you didn't trust me and that I made poor decisions. And so that's why I responded in anger. But all of that is educating myself or my triggers or my trauma, how it shows up in my life and how it affects my relationships. Amazing. So that's powerful, that's powerful. So education brings us to a place of awareness. So all throughout today, we're gonna to go to a place of awareness, but our journey to mental wealth doesn't stop at education, doesn't stop at knowledge, doesn't stop at awareness. Uh, knowing is one thing, but you know, changing behavior is another thing. So the second thing that I believe uh, as we're on our journey to mental wealth is not just education, but it is also practice. So now that you are aware of your triggers, now that you are considering that some of the things that, that we've experienced in life are having you know, a, a negative effect or potentially are having a negative effect, what are some of the practices that we can begin to employ to get to the place of mental health and ultimately mental wealth? I think it comes down to staying in the tension of the moment of the feeling. Life offers us a number of opportunities to escape our reality, whether it is through a relationship, whether it's through working out, whether it's through some type of addiction. There are so many things that we can employ to say, I don't wanna feel that, so I'm not gonna feel it at all. But when mental wealth and practice is staying in the tension of that feeling of allowing it to really wash over you, identifying where you feel it in your body and sitting there. And for me, because I am a person of faith, it's like, God, this is it. This is the spot. We went through a hard time with one of our children. Um, this ain't stream, so, and they ain't here, so I'm gonna just tell you, was um, with my oldest son. And in that moment, it made me feel like all of the fears I had about having a child at 13 were being manifested in his life. Like, you missed this, you weren't a good mom, and so I've got like what Brene Brown would call a shame storm happening. And there were so many things that I wanted to do to escape those feelings and emotions, but I sat in them. And it was from that place that I asked for connection with God. Like, God, I, you know, I don't need the blessings right now. Now. I don't need the joy. I don't need you to give me something that I, uh, you know, been praying for that's going to be exceedingly abundantly. Like right now, I want to experience your presence in my pain. And what I love about my relationship with God, because God doesn't live in the realm of time, I can bring up a wound that I should be over because it happened 20 years ago. And God can show me the grace that existed in that moment, even though it didn't seem like there was grace. I love I love this about God because I feel like there have been so many moments where I looked back and there was a friend, there was a teacher, there was a lifeline that kept me connected to something real. And so when I um, am experiencing something that is challenging my ability to have mental wealth, it is threatening to bankrupt my mental wealth. Mm -hmm. I sit there and I stay in the tension of it mm -hmm. and I allow myself to see that... Um, this too shall pass. Yeah. And I think that when you stay in the tension, you start to really be able to trust that. When you don't stay in the tension, you start saying things to yourself like, I can't take another blow, not another phone call, not another text message. You start doubting your own strength. But staying in the tension shows you that there have been moments where I thought I was gonna give up, but I stayed there, I got the therapy, I worshiped from that place, I reached out to someone and asked for connection, and in staying in the tension, I learned that I can survive it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so important that we remember that this too shall pass. It doesn't mean that you won't cry. It doesn't mean that it won't be easy. It doesn't mean that you won't struggle. It doesn't mean you won't lose people along the way. But it passing, when it does pass, it's just another brush on the canvas. It's another, another brush on the masterpiece of what God is putting together. And trusting God's plan when you are in dark spaces mm -hmm. is really, really hard. Yeah. I ain't even, I, you know, I can't gas you up on that. Like, it's hard. It's not always easy. But when you do it once, you dare to do it again, and then you begin to trust God's faithfulness over the changes of life. 
Yeah, that, that leads to the third thing, which is discipline. So practice, you, you talked about therapy, uh, because now that I'm aware, I've got to do something about it. So therapy, sometimes um, therapy involves medication. Yeah. Not every time, but sometimes it does. Um, you mentioned worship, and I, and I do believe that worship is powerful. I, I think that, that you can literally be healed in worship. Um, and then you also talked about friends and community, and I think that that's awesome. So just following this journey to mental wealth, which goes through mental health, and so it is education, it is practice, and it looks like you want to say something else before I go into discipline. Well, a little bit, yeah. Because uh, well, I know you. I know. I, maybe I, it's a bridge. I was feeling you. I was feeling you. Ma maybe it's a bridge over troubled water. Come on. Uh, Come on. Um, I listened to a podcast called The Read, and Kid Fury was on in June. Yes, and um, he took a break from what he has been doing for years and admitted to his audience that he wasn't in the best space mentally. And I felt like that took so much courage um, to be willing to restructure your life so that you can experience the break that you need to really check in on yourself. Mm. And so I think that it's worthy of us saying when talking about practice and discipline that you may have to risk disappointing some people mm -hmm. to hang on to yourself. Mm -hmm. You may have to be willing to change the way your life is structured so that you can be built again. A lot of times we're going through reconstruction and trying to hold everyone else up. And you can't hold everyone else up and go through reconstruction. Not every time. Maybe you did it in the past. We older now. Things cost too much. It's, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Mental wealth is real. I'm not trying to go broke, trying to hold on to you and hold on to me at the same time. I got to pick something. And um, I think that it is worthy of us discussing, especially when we talk about community and our responsibility to our community and our responsibility to generational curses, you can break a generational curse by focusing on yourself and trusting that God can allow it to play out through you without putting the pressure of the generations on you every single time you show up in the space. I love it. Uh, in my latest book, Shameless Plug, Balance, we call that the power of no. How, how no is is powerful, and, and you you can't you can't have mental health or wealth if you don't get comfortable with no. And so Kid Fury essentially told all of his uh, podcast listeners, no. Can you imagine the pressure? Yeah. You know what I mean? You got you know hundreds of thousands of people, maybe millions of people waiting on you, but to to choose you requires you having a healthy relationship with no. It's powerful. So on our journey to mental wealth. We're going to get educated. Thank you so much again for this. This is all day. There's going to be knowledge being dropped. I see my friend Shaka here, and, and just knowledge is going to be dropped. Knowledge is going to be dropped. Uh, and then once we get that knowledge, knowledge unapplied, unpracticed is, is nothing. Sometimes it's even worse. If I know what to do but don't do it, that, that can have uh, even a more damaging effect. And so we're going to get the therapy. We're going to worship, right? That's what you do. Um, we're going to be in community. We're going to be open. We're going to be vulnerable. But I think that where the real breakthrough comes in as it relates to mental health and mental wealth is in your disciplines. It's, it's in being consistent. So I'll, I'll give like my personal testimony with discipline, if you would. For me, my, my biggest uh, issue in the area of mental health, and I think that this is not unique to me, I think many of us struggle with it, are negative thoughts. You know, you, you step into a moment, there's a, a huge opportunity there for you, but you know, right before you step into the moment, all of a sudden you are flooded with thoughts of inadequacy. You, you ultimately could, if you don't check it, talk yourself out of things instead of talking yourself into things. And so what I've learned to do, and this, this takes time, it takes time, is I am very, very um, regimented about my story. What I say to myself, the most important story in your life is a story you tell yourself every single day. And so I have a story about who I am, I have a story about um, my purpose, I have a story about what I can do, I have a story about my identity, 
that quite frank, and it's a good story, it's an amazing story, it's a brilliant story, because here is the truth, I wouldn't be here, you wouldn't be here, your, your life is the byproduct of a brilliant thought in God's mind. If God didn't think you being alive and breathing wouldn't be a brilliant thing, you wouldn't be here. And so, uh, so let's just honor the brilliance sitting next to us in this room right now. You're, you're brilliant. You are brilliant. You, and hear me, you are a good story. When, it, when, when everything is added up, you are an amazing story. Now, ha, does your story have some plot twists? Does your story have some unexpected disappointments and, and things that will trip you up and, and knock you off your feet? I was thinking about someone I lost um, a few years ago on the way here from the airport, and, and, and it was devastated, but I got through it. But ultimately, your story is good. So for me, as it relates to discipline, I'm very protective over the story I tell myself each and every single day. So much so that now, after maybe walking this out for about seven years, I have kind of almost like mental memory. You know how you have muscle memory? You do a certain muscle a certain way, your muscles respond. I have mental memory, which means that in many cases where I used to have to wrestle to embrace my story, because I was disciplined enough to rehearse my story day in and day out, use my story as a weapon against every negative story that would come my way, now it's actually a lot easier. It doesn't mean that I don't have to fight. It doesn't mean that I don't have to remind myself who I am, what I can do, where I'm going, who called me, who anointed me, who touched me, who blessed me, who all that kind of stuff. It doesn't mean that I don't have to remind myself, but discipline created a change in my mind. And so, so, so I am wealthier now. In other words, we know time is money, right? And so being able to quickly move to this place of optimism, this place of, of faith, this place of knowing who I am, I believe ultimately makes me more money. And if, I have, if it takes me five days to do something because I had to spend four days in depression to bring myself up to do it, I just lost money. And so I think that discipline, I hate to you know, do that money thing, but I believe that, that discipline is everything. So once you know what to do, once you have gotten the tools because you're putting what, what to do into practice, then you got to do it consistently. I, there's not a day that goes by that I don't wake up in the morning and tell myself who I am. What do you have written down? Things have been shared today. My wife said some brilliant things today. But when was the last time you got your journal out? And those whispers that you heard that affirmed you and who you were, those, those things that said that you're going to make it, when was the last time you picked that notebook up, you picked that journal up, you looked at it and reminded yourself of who you are? This is vital. Every time you get a good word, Charlemagne said, you know, my, my father-in-law, my, my wife, myself, you know, we're, we're putting out good word. And that's a gift from God, watch this, to perfect your mirror to perfect your mirror so that every single day before you start your day, you can pull up those thoughts, those words, those treasures that God gave you, that he spoke to you about who you are, what you can do, who you are not, and be shaped by it. If you look in the mirror long enough, you'll become the, ear, the image that you see. That's so good. We're, yeah, we're almost out of time. Did you have more? Mm -mm. Okay. We got six minutes. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> I want to say something because we're supposed to be talking about spirituality, yeah. the black church, and mental wealth. Mental wealth. Mental wealth. Um, I think that it would be remiss of us to not acknowledge that there have been moments within black church, because that's the only church I've been in. Um, maybe it happens in white churches. I don't know. It does. Um, <laughs> yep. <laughs> where you were not allowed to bring the truth of who you are into the space. Um, whether you're like me and you broke some of the church rules or you just became a disgrace to the dignity of what it means to be a Christian through the lens of religion and the, and the lens of church, I think that we have to take a moment and at least acknowledge and perhaps for some of you invite you to look beyond God being held in the hands of man and 
maybe challenge you to consider that though man may have dropped you or mishandled you or deformed you in an effort to mold you, that that was not a reflection of God's heart towards you. Mm, 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 um, mm. I, I don't know how much it counts, but I will say that I apologize as yeah. a faith leader. For real. For the moments where you were told to just pray it away, for the moments where you were told that you're never going to be one of the good girls or the good guys, or you're always going to be damaged, I apologize that you received those messages. And if there's anything that you take away from this moment and this conversation with us, I will say, if you have to bypass the church to get to God, I get it. I get it. We're not here to force you into something that hurts you. But I would just encourage you to not give up on your ability to remain connected with God because God still wants to be connected to you, um, that God still wants to show you that mirror of who you are and what he had in mind. And he knew all about you, the things that took mm. your faith leaders, your parents by surprise, and everybody was shocked and act like mm. you was crazy and there was something wrong with you. God knew all of those things mm -hmm. and was prepared to walk it out with you. And there is a scripture that it says, uh, this is my Bible encyclopedia, so if I jack this up, um, mm -mm. I expect for you to- Don't blame it on it. me. <laughs> But it talks about presenting yourself unto God holy and acceptable. Holy is not just like I did everything the right way. It's holy, like I'm going to bring all of myself into the presence of God. And I want to invite you in your own way and whatever makes you feel the most safe and most comfortable. It may not be in the pews. It may be in your car to just say, you know, like, here I am. You know, I'm a little raggedy here, but I think I got something to work with over there. Um, I'm still in pain over over here, but I'm also helping people over there because there's no doubt in my mind that when God looks at the narrative of your life, that he sees good in every portion of it, not because it always felt good, but because he can get it to the destination of good. And so I just pray that you would consider what it would be like to continue to be in relationship in spite of the ways that maybe black church or church or ministers or whoever have let you down. This is so powerful. Stand up, baby. This is, this is I'm so glad that you, you, you did that um, because in a room this size, and this is not a bash on the church because as much hurt perhaps we've all experienced in church has been a whole heck of a lot of help. Uh, and so I, I wanna say that, but that doesn't negate the fact that uh, some of you needed an apology because you, you've got a spiritual leader, whether it's a pastor, rabbi, imam, however you do what you do, a sheik, whatever, that will never say I'm sorry uh, because they're not healthy enough and safe enough and whole enough to say I'm sorry. So what you did, honey, by saying, and it, that wasn't cheap, like for real, like I get it. And we represent, you know, the, the church. God has put us in a very, very significant position in that space. I think that's powerful. The only thing I would add to that is that God is brilliant. <laughs> he is so much more brilliant than his representatives. And he is broad. He, he, is, he is a broad God. He's broad enough to wrap his arms around every human being on the face of the planet. And, uh, and you challenged us to, to maybe rethink God without doing so through the lens of church. And I think that's a, a powerful way to end. So uh, thank you. We love you. God bless you. Let's get wealthy up here.